Hey everybody, this is Mike. Welcome back to my shop and welcome back to my channel, Z Motorsports. Um, got another hopefully interesting job here going on in the shop today. Um, taking my uh, 2011 Jeep JK Unlimited uh, Rubicon and I'm pulling the uh, um, OEM axle, Dana 44 axle housing out and I'm putting in a Dynatrap Pro Rock 44. So, um, I've wanted to build one of these axles for a while. Uh, I've got 77,000, I think, on the Jeep right now on the odometer. I've probably towed it another 23 or 25,000, so we're about 100,000 miles on it. No issues or anything. I just want, I've always wanted to build up one of these. The, the Dana 44 in these is a bit anemic. I've sleeved and, I sleeved and gusted it when I first bought the Jeep. It only had 3,200 miles on it. I think it was about 5,000, maybe 6,000 miles is all I had on it when I sleeved and gusseted it and re-geared it and everything. And I put 538s in it. Uh, it's performed flawlessly. I'm running RCV axle shafts, uh, synergy ball joints and everything. But um, I've always wanted one of these Pro Rocks, the heavy duty one with the half inch thick wall tubing um, and the 3 8 and the quarter inch uh, bracketry and everything on it. Um, it's really a heavy duty unit, it showed up today, so I'm going to start pulling uh, my OEM one apart and, put, and remove it from the Jeep and start getting ready to stab this Pro Rock 44 in. Um, one of the other reasons why is because my son is getting ready to build his WJ and he wants to put JK axles under it, so he is going to take my OEM sleeves and gusset of Dana 44 and we're going to build a long arm suspension system and everything, and he's going to put it under his WJ. He's looking for a rear JK axle, Dan 44, right now, so um, that's kind of another reason, is I didn't want him to try to find one that somebody else had either hodgepodge together or bent it and tried to straighten it or, you know, just crack welds, whatever. So rather than him try to find one that's virgin that isn't bent or that's not just trash to begin with. I figured I would uh, let him take mine and I'll build me a, that way he knows the history on it and I'll build me a Pro Rock. So I just ordered a blank housing and I'm going to build it uh, myself. So um, start by removing the uh, um, OEM Dana 44. Give you a quick little preview here. Of the. Pro Rock 44, so it comes with the nodular, nodular iron um, differential cover. The uh, tubes are three inch diameter by half inch wall thickness. All the bracketry, these bracketry here is all three sixteenths um, brackets rather than like the 10 gauge stamped steel that the OEM ones were. All the steering and track bar brackets and everything are Down quarter inch. Air. You can see the thickness of the axle tube here, so it goes from my fingernail there to there, half inch thick tubing, 3 8 thick plate, um, all the brackets and everything for the shocks and the control arms and everything is all uh, 3 16 um, cast helical cut uh, coil pockets, um, polycarbonate uh, bump stops, um, this is all cast in, it's got all the provisions for my e-locker, and so it's uh, ready to pop the cover off, get a good cleaning, and start pulling my other one down and swapping ring and pinion and axle shafts and everything. So I got the cover off, and I just kind of wanted to do a shot of the gears there. See if I can turn this and get a look, see how good those gears looked, or good, how good they look after. Uh, I think I got about 70. So I've got 77,000 on the on the odometer, and I think it was around 5,000 when I put the axles and gears together on this. So 72,000. I think I've towed it about another 22 to 23,000. So we're coming up on 100,000 miles, and gears great, nice wear pattern. Everything looked good. I dumped the oil out of it. This is actually the third oil change. In that amount of time, I did one of the break in, and then I did one at about uh, 50,000, and then I uh, did one here just not too long ago, about a, yeah, about, about a year ago. I think it was before I uh, closed up my other shop while I had the lift operational, but I changed all the fluids and everything in it. So that's after three oil changes, and boy, it just looks 
looks practically brand new in there, so that's good news. Uh, now I'll start breaking down the uh, outer knuckles and everything, pull the shafts, and I'll get this axle out from okay. underneath. Okay, so at this point I'm into it about an hour, and I've got the, uh, all the outer knuckles from the outer knuckles out removed on both sides. So the uh, um, calipers, rotors, hubs, or unit bearings, whatever you want to call it, axle shafts, I got my RCV, axle shafts pulled out, and the knuckles pop loose at each hand. Um, I've got all my steering, I've got my tie rod, my drag link, and my track bar removed. So basically the only thing holding the axle are all my shocks are removed, all my electrical and, uh, connectors and my vent line. So the only things I have connecting right now uh, are my upper lower control arms each side and my axle straps. So I'm going to hurry and pull the carrier just because it's sometimes easier to pull the carrier out rather than wrestling around on the bench. So I'm going to pop the, car the uh, caps loose, pull the carrier out. More than likely I'll pull the pinion out here as well. So basically I just got a bare housing after and then I'll pop, then I'll lower it down a little bit on some jack stands pop my uh, axle straps loose and my control arms and raise it up away from the axle and pull the axle out. Then I'll put the new one over on the bench and uh, get these cleaned and start uh, setting up um, bearings and, and backlash and everything on the, in the new housing. So I had to go dig through all my stuff because I, I, my shop's still not fully set up yet. I still have stuff in the basement and so I had to go dig through and find my setup bearings so I was able to able to locate those, and uh, so I'll start uh, setting up the other one here. But I'm going to go ahead and zip this carrier out real quick. And again, I, I know I know what I've got for shims on either side of this one because I built this six years ago. But um, it's still a good idea to keep track of your shims on either side. So pull that now. This one actually has the little um, cage on it that holds your coil for your uh, for those uh, Rubicon people out there that have the uh, e-locker and then also at this point is where you want to pull your electrical connector apart and actually on this one you can do it from the top side like that tuck the wire down inside once you get the carrier out, you're going to want to pull that sensor um, because if you try driving the pinion out, you will damage it. So the carrier comes out first, the sequence is the carrier comes out first, then the sensor out the side, then the pinion. So keep that, please keep that in mind or you will uh, damage the sensor. And I'm assembling these, I've got a case spreader that goes in here and spreads apart. So. I definitely need to go down in the, in the uh, basement and find that because I use that upon assembly. But generally, you can pry them enough to get them out and not do it. Not all the time, sometimes. So, but those shims come off the right side. They're driving Let's the right ship on the video, but you can see the sensor in here. Let me zoom in there so you can get okay, sure you see it right that. there. Right here. Right into the pinion. I've seen people drive that pinion out, snap that right off. So once you get the, and the carrier has a dip, the disc that actually goes in, and it doesn't push on it like you'd think, it actually pulls on it. So when the coil engages and it allows that to shift over, it pulls, boom, and that's what tells you your dash indicator light that your uh, front end's locked in. So you pull it out from the outside here, it just threads out. So you pull it out, then you can take your pinion out. And then uh, pretty much you got a bare. Bare empty uh, house. I didn't want to bore you with uh, disassembly and the cleaning of parts. So, got everything kind of cleaned and laid out here, ready to start setting up. And I want to point a couple things out. First of all, it's best if you have a case spreader because you want to hook into the case here and spread this apart. 
This is what sets on, on this style housing. This is actually what sets your carrier bearing preload. Um, you want to be able to. I mean, you can fudge it and get the bit and get the shims in there, but I guarantee you're going to damage shims in the process. It's next to impossible. I've taken the thinner ones and sandwiched them between, like these thinner ones here, sandwiched them between the uh, thicker ones, which is generally what I do anyway, but I've done that in the past, and then set them up in here a little bit of an angle, and set it in there and tapped it in slowly in a pinch. I've done it that way, but to be honest with you, the best way is to have a case spreader. Um, it's, a, it's a big investment. Uh, I think some places will rent them, but it is a big investment, but that's the best way of doing it. Next is I've got some test bearings, and what it is is I just have a few thousandths removed from the inside, from the ID of these. Um, I'm going to start with the same 41 thousandth shim on the pinion that I took apart, and I'll put this together and paint it with a, a gear marking compound and test it, and then I'll look if, I'm, if my pinion's too deep or shallow. Um, like I said, there's my test bearing, and you can see it's a snug fit, but I can push it on and off by hand, so it really aids in uh, setting up in these, uh, these sets. Um, is there differences between bearings? People say, oh, you want to use the same bearings that you put it together. You know what, I've been doing this for nearly three decades now, and, and I'll admit bearings have gotten better over the years, but I've never had a problem with all the gear sets I've done where I've used setup bearings. So. If there's variances from one to another, it's minor, very minor. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and now one thing I do want to recommend too is not, for setup where you're just checking your clearances and everything, it's not too critical. But when it comes down to final assembly, when you put things together, I like to use some gear oil on the bearings so they don't put you're not putting them together dry for two reasons. Number one, obviously, the startup, but also number two is when you're checking your rotating torque when you're doing that crush sleeve and your uh, carrier, your side carrier preload. So um, now when it comes down to putting your final bearings on, the bearing heater is the best way to do that. You set your bearings on them on here, heat them up. <clears throat> I've got some marking crayons at uh, 250 and 350. Generally on these ones here, you run these up about 350 degrees on a ball bearing where you've got smaller contact area, usually 250. But they expand just a couple thousands, enough, enough that they're, they're a slip fit. <coughs> and then they, because they cool, they tighten down on That way there's no, no min minimal stress uh, on, the on these ones where you're trying to stick everything in. It's really kind of hard to get the... Um, uh, housing in a press obviously so on the carrier bearings a lot of times I'll press those on but when it comes to these I like to set these in and have the bearing heating up and then you drop the, the uh, uh, crush sleeve in or if you're if you're doing a crush sleeve elimination kit the, the shims and then you drop that in and then when you hit the bearings in you drop right in there's no beating on it. beating beating on a bearing hands down is my Last resort only, field repair, whatever you want to call it. I just despise it. If you don't, if you don't have to do it, I recommend you don't. So, um, that being said, looking at these caps here, I wanted to point out these Pro Rock 44s are awesome housings. In my opinion, they're probably one of the best aftermarket housings out there. Um, I mean, from the nodular casting, I mean, the thickness of the webbing in them, the, from the frame, uh, upper frame mounts. The way they're, I mean, this is 3 16 steel, gusseted, um, half inch thick tubes, three inch diameter. The stock ones were two, they're over two and a half OD, and I think they're less than five, they're, they're like quarter wall thickness. So these are, these. this is hands down, one of the stoutest axles out there. Now there are people say G2s and Terraflexes and everything, and I'm not bad mouthing any of those, it's just I've done these and I, 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 I'm impressed with these. That being said, when you get these, set your carrier in and check your caps. I have not done one of these yet where these caps haven't need to be clearanced a little bit. Um, as you can see, I've taken that one over to the disc sander and I've knocked a little bit off. 
on the, uh, on the ring gear side, I like to have preferably about 30 thousandths all the way around when everything when it's put together. So I do a test fit there. And on the uh, coil side, or on the, uh, the short side, if you, if you will, um, I like to have that clearance and the, this little pin. The factory style uses a thinner cap and it uses this stamped steel piece under the heads of the bolts that goes over and catches the coil and holds the coil in position on these e-lockers, on these electronically locked carriers. On the Pro Rocks, they've got a thicker cast cap and they've got the little pin or the little tip here cast right into it. Every one of these that I've done, I've had to come in here and file these a little bit and make sure and get clearance on that. What happens is when you torque that down, it preloads a little bit and puts too much pressure on the side and basically wants to lock up the, the carrier in there. So um, you can take a disc sander. Usually I'll take a disc sander and knock the sides down a little bit and then I clamp this in the soft jaws on the vi in the vise and I'll come in with a file and creep up on it because I want to leave as much meat as I can on that pin right there but I, want, I don't want it to, to lock up. So make sure you clearance those on the pro rocks. Um, I think that's pretty much it for, for, for cleanup and prep work. Uh, I've got the new carrier bearings pressed on the side of the carrier and new outer races. So I'm gonna clean up, I, I, I do need to clean up these spacers and I'm gonna start with the factory, or not factory, but where this axle was set up before um, with these 538s, because it was dead on, um, excellent, beautiful wear pattern. So I'm, I'm going to match, try to match that. I'm not trying to match that, I'm going to match that. So um, let me clean these shims up, and then we'll come in. I'll put the pinion in, and then drop the carrier in, and we'll paint up the teeth, and we'll uh, get a preliminary uh, setting of what All right, so I've got my uh, pinion installed, and this is, I've got my setup bearings on it, so there's a few thousands removed off the ID. Allows it to, it's a snug but slip fit onto the pinion. <coughs> so I have it <coughs> installed, my outer and the inner one, outer one, yoke, and the nut. And I've just got enough preload on it, uh, it's probably less than five to 10 inch pounds of rotating torque. When you're final done, when you're done, you, when you, with that crush lead, you're going to want to end up with around 15 inch pounds of rotating torque, somewhere in that range. So, on new bearings, on used bearings, you go a little less, but this is going to be all brand new bearings. So, pinions installed. I've got my case spreader on. Spread my case a little bit to allow the carrier and the shim stacks to go in easily. And then I'll paint up my ring gear. Put it in, torque my caps on, release everything, and run it through a couple of test patterns, uh, or a couple of tests. So I've got all my notes here from when I built my axle six years ago. So I started with the 41,000 shim out of my OEM housing, that's where I'm going to start with. And then I've got, had 141,000 on the left side, 133 on the right side, so I'm going to try that and see where that lands me. Uh, when I built this, I was about six and a half thousandths backlash. So we're going to see where that lands me real quick. And I've uh, got a funny feeling it's not gonna be close, so I'm gonna have to redo the, the shimmy. But at least I can paint it up and see whether I need to move pinion or carrier or both. So the pinion depth is probably the hardest to get, and most critical. Um, uh, some of them mark the ends, and you can put a thick gauge in here and start there. I've done that. I've got a, 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 an indicator for that. Um, these particular ones did not have these had a number or a lettering system on them. So um, that being said, I'm just going to go in. I've had good luck just reading reading patterns. So uh, I've got my, my two shin stacks for the left and the right side, and they match what I built before. Um, gear marking compound. Whenever you buy a master kit, generally they'll come with some, with some form of, of a marking compound, um, whether it be a, a bought kits from Jegs, Summit, for, or Summit Racing, Northridge 4x4, Randy's Ring and Pinion, most of those when they come with a full set of new bearings, whether it be you know, any high quality kit, Timken bearings, uh, so forth, SKFs. 
you, they'll, they'll usually provide some form. Now these ones here, I think I bought these ones. I can't remember if this was Summit Racing or Randy Dream Pinion years ago when I uh, just bought a couple of packages of, or a couple of little tubs of gear marking compound. A little bit goes a long way. So if you want to put it on and paint up the teeth, but you don't want to have it just oozing everywhere. So I paint up about four to six teeth. And then you want to turn the ring gear over. I usually grab a rag and hold my pinion so it drags through my hand, add some preload. And you want to go to the coast side and the drive side. And then you want to check it for, uh, for appearance. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get to that point. So I'm going to paint up a couple of teeth, probably half a dozen teeth. And then set this together, and we will uh, see what we've got this all painted up and uh, ready to uh, do a test fit here. One thing I forgot to mention is I like to sandwich the thinner shins in between the thicker ones when I'm doing this, just to kind of help protect them a little bit um, when you're putting these together. So uh, those are. Ready to go in. And then also, you can, that's going to be kind of hard to see in the video, but I've got all my engraved. I engraved my uh, the date I did these. The preload, I had 13 inch of the preload on the pinion, pinion preload. The backlash, I had 7,000. Yeah, 7,000 is here. So my notes show 6.5 to 7,000. So, anyway, so I've got that engraved. So now, when I set this one up, I will basically put a line through those and come in and put the new information on it. So, now back in the office a little bit and uh, torque them into place. putting your dial indicator on, you want to make absolutely certain that you are perpendicular to the teeth. So if you notice these key teeth are helical cut, if you come in and put your dial indicator up here, it's going to be, it's not going to be uh, perpendicular to the teeth, so you're going to get a, unless you want to get out the algebra and calculus and start calculating all your angles, I suggest it's uh, a lot easier to just go ahead and put it on the teeth so it's perpendicular. So, that being said, I'm going to do this so where it can be seen here in the video. Okay, take two. So I ended up moving, removing ten thousandths from under the pinion. So, and it was off quite a bit, so I like to make big changes at first, and then if I go to the other extreme, then I know I'm somewhere in the middle. The big change is 10, 12,000, somewhere there. Small changes, I'll go three to 5,000. So, and then I ended up, because I moved the pinion closer, I moved the carrier away, uh, and basically I just switched the side. So I'm running one, uh, 131 on the left, one, about 141 on the other, and it, I might have a little too much backlash. You throw a dial indicator on there to see where I'm lying. But I think I might have too much. I 
But no sense in guessing. Yeah, I've got way too much. I've got eleven thousandths backlash there. So way too much for my liking. Okay, take five. Six and a half. I can live with that. Six and a half to seven. Four spots. I can live with that. Alright, so just doing putting some finishing touches here on prep work, getting this pinion ready to put in. So I just take some regular 80-90 gear oil and run it around and let it soak into the uh, bearing there. Then I'll take a little bit of my finger and run it around the race in the uh, housing. I have my bearing heating up and I just use these thermal melt temperature uh, crayons. And it is really close to being ready. So um, you want to put it on the inner race. And it's melting off, so that's getting pretty close. These come in different temperature ranges. Um, do not forget to put your crush sleeve on. It'll only go on one way because it's larger OD on one end than the other. Um, so it's ready. Get all your stuff ready. Get your uh, slinger, your yoke. Um, I also take the seal because you actually have to pound these in or tap these in rather. So I pack the back side with grease to hold that spring in. It'll just dissolve when the oil hits it anyway. And then I have my seal driver. It's kind of a homemade job, but it reaches over the pinion. One last thing, once on a final side, I'll, I'll go ahead and put this on, torque it all down and get the crush sleeve down. And then I'll pull the nut off and I'll put the new nut on and I'll put some RTV sealant around the splines <clears throat> because Oil will creep up through here and fill this cavity. So I put some RTV around that. And then I use uh, Red Loctite um, 271 on the uh, nut, on the end of the threads of the uh, pinion. Plus you want to use the new nut that comes with it. So I'm going to go ahead and get all that ready to go. And uh, we'll go over here to the housing. And then once all that's done, then I'll go ahead and start putting all right, the chair in. I shouldn't have to mention this, but I'm going to anyway. The bearing that's been on this bearing heater is going to be hot. So please use caution when uh, installing it. Now you want to be careful that as you put this oil on this, you leave this a little bit. It's gonna
Okay, rattle that down on. Then you want to take your grunt bar. I still got clear. Uh, I haven't crushed that sleeve all the way. So I want to take my grunt bar. The this is, again, this is a home fabricated tool. Nothing more than just a couple of straps. Uh, holes drilled in it and welded to a tube. And you can make them specific for whatever. And then this is also where you're going to want to use your um, inch pound, your inch pound torque wrench, dial type torque wrench, or you can use the needle, but you want to check the rotating. You want to actually checking the rotating torque. All right, so I moved my grunt tool, got my um, proto inch pound dial torque wrench. Like I said, you can use the needle type, either one. But what you want to look at is the rotating torque, not the breakaway torque. So if you set your needle or you, you watch it when an initial starts to go, it'll be higher and then it'll settle. So you want to watch, you want to get in where you can actually watch it for a range. And barely, barely registering in there. So, okay, we're getting close. When you get down to the last little bit, actually the uh, crush sleeve crushes a little easier the last, because uh, you've already, You've already taken that crush sleeve and bulged it a little bit. That initial, getting that initial bulge or that initial set is what uh, takes the majority of the, uh, of the uh, pressure that you're putting on. Once you get to that point, usually a long ratchet or a breaker bar will get you, allow you to creep up the last little bit. Um, on ones that do not, the ones that you're setting up where you're doing either a uh, crush sleeve eliminator kit or if you come from the factory with shims, you'll actually torque those to 200, uh, most of them, check your specs again, but most of the ones I've done, you're torquing those to around 250 foot pounds. And I'm just moving. Dead nuts on. Okay, pinning on Pinning in. Got the case spread. And I am ready. Put the carrier in for the last time. Let me call my final checks. Machine back noise.
This one's got the little set that's got to fit into the coil and the Rubicons and the uh, locker. here. Now that I've got the carrier in, the case released, cap bolts torqued, I check my pinion preload again, which also combined with my carrier preload. And like I said, I usually try to shoot for in the six to eight range. Um, hit nailed it right in the money. Uh, that, that way you know you've got the proper shim pack between sides to side. Because if you, if you don't have the proper shim <coughs> pack, especially on that, on that, uh, side that's opposite the pinion under heavy load it's going to want to push that ring gear away which moves the pinion out to the tip of the teeth which is the weakest point so you can get deflection and actually break gears that way so um proper preload i say six to eight usually additional and i'm right there at 22 inch pounds rotating torque now so that's the 15 i had plus seven additional and that's actually, I've gone, I've gone around and kind of tapped around everything, so everything kind of, uh, all the stresses and the material and the bearings and everything kind of relaxes. And I've got my seven um, inch pounds additional, so I've got my notes here. I'm going to go ahead and put a line through them with my engraver, and I'm going to go to a clean spot right next to it probably, and I'm going to engrave all my new numbers. So, pinion preload, 15 inch pounds. Carrier preload is plus seven, or you can put 20, but I usually just put a plus seven because it's an additional to the pinion. Backlash is at six thousandths. It's a good solid six thousandths. I've checked it in several different places, and it was anywhere from a six is the tightest and about six and a half at the, at the fattest point. So that's when we go ahead and engrave in here and up with the date. So then I can start going ahead and closing things up. And I better tuck that connector up there before I go and do a stupid thing like forget and then put the cover on. So I'm going to put the cover on right before I call it quits. So I'll put some sealant around, put the cover on, get it all torqued in place and then next time you see this I'll be putting it back under the Jeep and getting all the other Okay, things. so I've got my axle hanging up under the Jeep. I've got my upper and lower control arms now. I've got my axle straps, um, limiting straps hooked up. I just got to hook up the wiring, drive shaft, um, and then that aspect's done. And then from there, I'm going to uh, put ball joints in, knuckles, axle shafts, symbol lows, and steering components. But uh, let's start finishing this. All right, so now we're at the point where you uh, get your uh, ball joints, so you get your receiver and your uh, install cup. Um, Go ahead and choose your correct adapters and uh, get ready to start installing ball joints. So um, I've used the OTC, I actually have an OTC one, I have a snap-on one. Um, I kind of prefer the snap-on one, but they're both good. I know a lot of people use the hybrid freight ones. To me, the, the C's uh, kind of want to flex a little bit more on them, but for a one-time use, they'll, they'll, they'll get you through the job. So. Let's uh, get ready to All right, so I thought I'd bring you in next year and show you what I'm doing here. I've got RCV axle shafts in front of my uh, uh, JK. Um, they've got, I don't know, 70 some odd thousand miles on them now, so they're far from uh, um, new by any means. But I uh, started picking up a little bit of a noise in the front end when turning, so I figured it was probably time to. Uh, tear them apart and so I ordered a couple of rebuild kits to have on hand when I pulled them apart. 
So I'm going to zoom the camera in here and kind of show you what I found and, and, and compare it to the new uh, um, race and spherical, uh, the spherical race in here. So let me okay, change so it the camera. After getting it all apart, actually the, the grooves that the are machined in the outer stub shaft here actually feel pretty good. There's a couple little wear marks, nothing major, nothing, nothing like I was kind of expecting after hearing the... Uh, clickety clack going on in there um, but I did once I got the uh, um, inner race out and um, cleaned up there are some pretty good scoring marks down in here there's some pretty good burrs on my windows. Stock JK's usually uh, are, are, don't need to be changed uh, they have the steering angle changed because they uh, are less than the 42 degree max that RCV recommends but I think after seeing what I'm seeing now, I think I'm definitely going to double check that when I get it together. But you can see that locks up on me. Now granted, the balls aren't, in, are, aren't orientated in there, but um, it, it's got some pretty nasty catches on it. And so if you if I just kind of slide it on the splines there, it only turns so far and catch. And the same thing when I when I go to take the, 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 the spherical cage and turn it, it binds in a couple of different spots there. Now, compare that to the new one, put it on. That outer spherical cage spins all over and at every, at every pretty, much, pretty much every angle, it spins freely. So, that being said, I think the clickety-clack noises are these, uh, is this ball and ca or this uh, spherical ca uh, outer cage going past the catches and the ball's kind of snapping past as that cage is going around. Because it's going straight, it was fine, it's just when I was turned. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in the RCVs. I mean, I, you pay $1,300 for a set of axle shafts to be the you know the, the best I like and the off-roading because you can I mean it does transfer the torque without getting that pulsation in your steering wheel and it does it efficiently but I got to tell you when you're coming down off a, a, a hill and you've got you know a, a built up fairly nice Jeep and it's clickety clacking all the way down the trail and, and I take pride in my shit being some of the nicest on the trail or in the on the street whatever and when you spend that kind of money, because I did not cut corners when I built this, and you spend that kind of money and have it making that kind of embarrassing noises coming down a trail, it's frustrating as hell. It, it, uh, I'm not going to lie, I was a little frustrated and not really thrilled to be on the trail that day. So, yeah, some people say that I shouldn't let a little thing like that ruin my day of wheeling. It's my OCD, I don't know what it is, but... It, I couldn't wait to get off the trail, get out of, out of four-wheel drive and call it a day. So, um, it was frustrating to say the least. Okay, so you want to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the kind of the cone on that, let me see if that side profile shows up. Uh, this is a little more, uh, a little more abrupt. This is here tapers up in. You want to make sure that goes up in. So you kind of want to stand it up because your window is obviously going to be your narrowest point. You want to stand it up in there and just kind of find a way to... Okay, that's a trial and error. There we go. So again, you can flip that the wrong direction. When you put it in, you can flip that the wrong direction. You just want to make sure that's pointing the right direction. Then you want to offset your, your cage a little bit. Grab a ball. I just use a brass hammer. You can use either or. So I'll drive that down into one. Now directly straight across from it. directly straight across from that, you're going to want to take, now drive down on the, uh, try to drive down either on the ball or the outside, the cage, so that hole pops up, and you take your other ball, okay, now drive down another one, and just work your way around until all your balls are in. Okay, so now that you've got everything installed, everything's nice and snug, everything cleaned off really good, um, go ahead and pack it full of grease. So you want to 
just kind of push it down in, get it working into all the voids and everything, and then uh, you can go ahead and uh, I've already put the new snap rings on the shafts. So once you get the grease packed in there, put some grease on the splines, go ahead and drive the axle shaft down in, and then you're ready to assemble it into the boot. So when you do that, you'll want to take your boot, put it inside the knuckle, and then run your shaft through it. Um, you want to run your shaft through it because this won't fit through the opening where the uh, unit bearing goes. When you put this in, you're going to get a bit of an air void, or excuse me, not an air void, you're going to get a, an, an air pocket trying to put that boot when you're trying to go over that. So um, I've used something underneath it, um, something as simple as a 20 thousandths feeler gauge or a small screwdriver and a pinch, even just so as you push that over, that it allows that air to escape. Otherwise, you're just going to have a bellows there and it's going to trap it and you're going to be fighting trying to get the, uh, this polypropylene to expand as well as trying to compress that air because that is a pretty tight seal around that sphere there. So just put something underneath it in your, and as, you're put, as you're putting your shaft in your front axle, go ahead and put something in there. Usually a good smack with a, a rubber mallet. It will pop it right in there, pull it out, and you're good to go. Okay, that one is ready for okay. You smear a little bit of grease around the end of the spline so it goes through the seal better. Um, less chance of uh, catching that seal in there. And put it in past your boot there. You can feel it going in. Here's what I'm going to do. Install that around the boot. Das boot. And in like four. Okay. It's like one shaft in. We're going to do the other side. Then I'm going to start putting my back, uh, my dust shield, unit bearing, brakes together, and then steering. Before I put the steering in, I'll probably go ahead and put the gear oil in now that the seat and out the shafts are in. Some of these the variants stairs. come with new. Um, wiring, some of them do not. This one actually does. So, uh, the last few of these I've done um, have come with them that way, but you uh, definitely get them without. So, I like to go ahead and put a little NICs on the splines. So, I'll brush the NICs on a um, little bit inside there, down there, and then also on my, my bolts, my fasteners for the uh, unit bearing, and then as I'm putting the uh, um, bearing on, I'll uh, come back and uh, fish the wiring up through, and then I'll hook the wiring up afterwards. Push a little on that outside. And the ID bore the spindle, and a little bit around the bearing. Not a lot, just a little bit to coat it. Boy, that sure makes, especially with our winter driving and any water or muddy, dirty, wet roads drive down and off-road, sure makes that a lot nicer coming apart. Mainly because of our shitty winter roads, but. Okay, so now if you do this the other way and you take the sensor out, you pull this, there's a five millimeter socket head well, it's a six millimeter socket head cap screw, but it takes a five millimeter Allen. You'll want to actually put it back in. So if I was using this other one, now is where I would snake it through there, put it in while you can still move this around. Then go ahead and start your uh, bolts from the back side here. And then these take a 12 point, 13 millimeter, and the shallow works best so you can get your uh, torque wrench around the back side on them. And it 
least that is now up and supported um, so that axle's not just hanging down there on that seal or anything inside of there. So I'll uh, grab the torque wrench next. Get that torqued in place. Okay, so um, got my 12 points, 3 inch drive, 13 millimeter. Now, I, ne I didn't used to think I was a tool snob, but I guess maybe I am a little. I found that with the RCVs, the snap on socket actually works a little better just because the thinner wall thickness doesn't encroach into that um, uh, RCV boot quite as much. So I'll run these probably to let me hit them at 50. Now I'll go to like 75. All right, so got this locked into place. Um, got my axle nut. I'm go ahead and thread on. And I'm just going to run it on a little bit here. Just about bottoms out. Washer's still flopping around. Okay. Now this takes a uh, 35 millimeter socket. 36s will work, but the correct actual correct size is 35. I know a lot of the forums and everything say 36. 36 works fine, but technically it's 35 millimeter. So I'm going to run this up to 100 foot pounds first. Pull them together. Close as I thought I did. Okay. 150. And go on 75. Okay. Size pretty much assembled. Okay, so while I'm right here and this is easy to get to, I'm going to go ahead and check my strain angle. Um, RCV recommends no more than 42 degrees um, for, the, for their joints, for their CV joints. So you, there's several ways you can do this. Uh, I've seen guys lay out tape on the floor and check it with the tires on, which that's easy way to do it. Find your center line, um, center line your axle. And then you're steering, and that's easy enough to do. And then turn the tire all the way to the lock to check it, and then put a protractor down and measure it. Um, but without the tire and everything on, this is just as easy to do it. So um, I just go off the axle center line here against the dust shield and lay it right against the front of that axle there, and I'm about 30. Thirty-seven to thirty, yeah, about thirty, thirty-seven degrees, thirty-eight maybe. So we're well within the specs, so we're good. Okay, there. I'm going to go one step further here because curiosity is getting to me. RCV says no more than forty-two degrees, or excuse me, they say any more than forty-two degrees can cause oversteering the joint and damage the cage and everything. And I. You know, I was told that the stock Jeeps, Jeeps have around 30, uh, 38 or so, so don't, no need to uh, have to adjust them. But just for shits and giggles, while I had a, a, a good, a, a, an uninstalled joint here, I grabbed this joint and I pulled it all the way to where the sphere of the, of, of the burf, the burf field, is hitting the axle. And I'm going to measure that now, just for shits and grins here, so we can see what um, on the bench what a joint actually is capable of. So let's lay that right down the center line. Center line of the axle to center line of the output shaft. And that is nowhere near 42 degrees. That is I'm going to say my 39 and a half to, well, I'm lining right up with the splines on that. 
and that's just a, a, a mark's width under 40. So I would say if you're doing 42 degrees, you're oversteering this, according to what I'm seeing. So I may add a shim, because I was 39 something, so if you get a, a hit a bounce or something like that while you're driving, uh, I think I'm gonna add a shim on your mine. I mean, they're, 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 they're four doors, they're buses, they don't turn real sharp anyway, so I may take and put a washer under mine and see if I can get mine down to maybe 30, instead of 38-ish, maybe get it down around 36, 37, just for, uh, just for a little added insurance. I mean, if you gotta make a three-point turn in one area versus another, it's not that big of a deal. We just did Black Bear. And I don't know that one to two degrees of turning would have made a hill of beans of difference. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm, I'm just, the lines are just south of lining up from 40 degrees on that. So, if they're saying 42, I don't think it's on, I don't know what joints they're talking about. Because this one is, uh, if you hit 42 degrees on this one, you're oversteering it. So, I think I'm going to add a... Uh, washer and it's pretty simple you just take your uh, where your stops are on the back I believe it's a 9 16 it's a 3 8 bolt so you just take a 9 16 wrench and pop it loose and the nut is welded the spot welded to the to the threads on the bolt so just to grab it down by the jam nut back it out put a washer underneath it and then I'll remeasure that and see where I'm sitting okay all the way to the lock there and I'll line it up right along the outside of my axle tube right there Line it up with the inner tube. And I am right on 37. Thirty-seven on the money with one um, with one wa uh, three eighths washer under the head of that. So that's where I'm going to leave it. On a 37 degree steering angle, I can live with that. Like I said, on Black Bear, we're probably, it's probably the most, one of the most technical as far as uh, switchbacks. And I don't think that one, one and a half degrees, I don't think would have made a bit of difference on that. I still would have been doing three and five point turns coming off of it. So that way we don't bind the, make sure I don't bind the axle. So, all right, on the other side, put it together and uh, Move on okay, one thing I didn't show on the short side, on the driver's side, because some, usually I don't need to do that. Usually those will press in far enough. But on this long side, they do, and, and RCV does supply this installation tool. Once you get your axle in this far, pull your boot out away from the tube there, and then this goes in behind it, and then push against it. That basically, other, otherwise, by the time you're trying to push that boot in and it bottoms out against the tube, there's not enough left there to, to really seat that boot on. So this spaces it out. Oh, I'm thinking that's about an inch. Yeah, it's an inch exactly. So that spaces it out an inch um, and it seats back against it. Then you can go ahead and push um, the axle in. Sometimes it requires a little assistance from a dead blow, but that pop Got that my slid right in. The suspension stuff just about wrapped up. Uh, I've got my Terraflex heavy duty track bar, adjustable track bar in. I've got my Terraflex heavy duty uh, drag link. I just have to adjust it after when I get the uh, get sit down on the ground. And I have my rock crawler um, heavy duty tie rod. Um, dine track axle under it. Uh, the only thing I have left to do now is install my brakes. And I'm ready to set it down on the ground and go through and tighten up all my suspension components. You don't, I think I mentioned this in one of my other videos, but you don't want to tighten your suspension system at either full stuff or at full droop. You want to tighten all your suspension bushing, anything that's got a bushing in it, you want to tighten those at ride height. Reason being is if you, it's stretched out like this right now, sitting in the static relaxed position, you tighten that bolt down, as soon as you set it down, it's gonna roll that rubber encapsulated bushing. It's gonna roll that center sleeve in there. It's gonna preload it and it's gonna force premature wear. By setting it down at ride height and then tightening everything, you're basically centering that bushing in its travel. So if it flexes up, it rolls, it, it rolls one direction. 
as you send it down, it rolls the other inside that rubber encapsulated outer shell. So that's why you want to make sure that everything's at ride height when you torque everything down. So there's Pro Rock install on my 2011 JK. All right, eight. so that uh, concludes the uh, Pro Rock 24 build up on our uh, 2011 JK Unlimited. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, appreciate you uh, taking the time to watch this. And uh, if you like it, hit like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.